And now to click it in and find out if we got it right. Two, one, zero. I feel like I'm cracking a safe right now. One and one. I am sharing with you today one of the coolest math facts I have seen in quite some time. It deals with polynomials and determining a polynomial given some amount of information. We are going to determine a polynomial from just two points. Normally, two points are enough information to give you a line or a first degree polynomial, but we can do this with any degree polynomial. Just to give you a sense of how this works first, let's generate a polynomial, and we are going to determine the equation of this polynomial from just two pieces of information. The value of the polynomial when we plug in one, and then the value of the polynomial when we plug in one more than whatever that initial value was. So in the example that I have pulled up here, f of one is equal to six. We're gonna add one to that number, one plus six is seven, and we're gonna compute f of seven. Here we get a result of 462. Now the trick is what we want to try to do is to express 462 as a sum of the powers of that number seven. So that is we want to figure out how many seven to the fourths, how many seven to the thirds, how many seven squareds, how many sevens, and how many units are there that we can add together to make 462. I know that seven cubed is already 343, so seven to the fourth is clearly too large for 462, but I need one of these 343s. That would leave 119 left over, so that's gonna be at least two seven squareds. Two times 49 is 98. That still leaves me with 21 more, and 21 more is three sevens. In this case, we don't need any units. What that tells me is that this polynomial should be 1x cubed plus 2x squared plus 3x plus nothing, which of course we would not normally write down. Let's take these coefficients over to our little machine. We've got 1x cubed, 2x squared, 3x's, and no units, and there it is, success. What is going on here? This is a third degree polynomial. Most of the time that you have a third degree polynomial, you would need at least four points to be able to fully determine the polynomial. Let's take a step back here and talk about what even is a polynomial and why is it that we need so many points to determine a polynomial? What is it that's special about seeing we can determine a polynomial from just two points? Polynomials are these mathematical objects that for whatever variables are involved have only non-negative integer powers. So things like x squared plus 5x minus 7 is a great example of a polynomial because we're using only non-negative integer powers, 2, 1, which of course we don't normally write down, and then x to the 0, which also we don't normally write down. For a single variable polynomial like this, the degree of the polynomial is determined by whatever the greatest individual power is. And so this is an example of what we call a second degree polynomial. You might remember from math class when we graph a second degree polynomial, that is when we graph something where x is being squared, we get a parabola, this nice u kind of shape. If we imagine trying to determine a polynomial from just some number of points that we know fit on the polynomial, you can see in this case, two points would not be enough. Two points fully determine a line, but for a quadratic function like x squared plus 5x minus 7, that parabola can have lots of different shapes. At minimum, it can be an opening up parabola, like the one that I've drawn here, or it could just as easily be an opening downward parabola. But of course, it's not only the opening up or opening down that's free right now. We could have it be a super tall parabola, so something that looks like this, or through those same two points, this could just as easily be a super broad parabola. And so there are many, many possibilities right now unless we fix a third point. Once we fix that third point, there's only one possible quadratic polynomial through those three points. This relationship holds up in general. Whatever the degree of the polynomial is, we need one more number of points than that in order to completely determine the polynomial. So the fact that I can have Desmos randomly generate some polynomial and then using this special trick express the coefficients of that polynomial from just two inputs is crazy. Now, as you can see on screen, the reason this works has to do with picking different base number systems. In this particular case, let's say I tell you I have some polynomial and when we plug in one, we get back 15. We're gonna increase that 15 by one to 16. And when we plug in 16, we get back 8,550. If we can express 8,550 in base 16, you can see here it converts to what looks to us like the number 2,166. Those digits, or in hexadecimal, I don't know what they're called, hexadigits or something, form the coefficients 
coefficients of our polynomial. So this must be no x to the fourths, 2x to the thirds, 1x squared, and then 6 each of x and the units digit. This is working because all the polynomials that I'm having Desmos randomly generate have positive coefficients only. Or I guess I should say non-negative because of course some of the terms are missing, meaning some of the coefficients are actually zero. But as long as your polynomial uses only non-negative integers as coefficients, you can fully determine that polynomial from just these two inputs. When we add this condition to our polynomials that they can only use non-negative integer coefficients, it turns the polynomial into something much more like a number in a base x system or whatever the variable is that we're using to define our polynomial. In a given base system, values are uniquely represented. That is, there's only one set of bits or digits or any other symbols in the number system that represent a particular value. Consider something in our base 10 number system like 162. When we say this is 162, we are thinking about powers of 10 for each digit in the number system. The one in what we call the hundreds place, we kind of automatically know is the same thing as one times 10 squared. That's why we call it the hundreds place, and that's where the value is coming from. The six here represents six sets of 10 to the first, and that's why its value is 60. The two on the other hand is in our units digit, that is 10 to the zero is one, and so the two here literally represents two units. It is the sum of these quantities that give the number its value which of course to us in a base 10 number system looks exactly like 162. If we took these same symbols though, 162, and we represented them in a base eight number system, this wouldn't be one in the hundreds place, it would be one in the eight squareds place, that is the 64s place. The six wouldn't be six tens, it would be six eight to the first. The two on the other hand would still be two units because any number raised to the zero power is one. When we add this all up however, in our base 10 number system, 162 base 8 doesn't have the value 162, it has the value 64 plus 48, that makes 112, plus 2 makes 114. And so what looks to us like 162, if it's in base 8, is actually the same as the value 114. A number system primarily has two requirements. One is that it has place value. Each subsequent place in the number system represents the next power higher of whatever the base is. So if I were to go one digit more, that would have to be in the eight to the thirds place, or what we could call the 512s place. The other thing that's required is that the symbols in the number system need to be up to but one less than whatever the base number system is. So in a base eight system, we can use any of the digits zero through seven, but we can't use the digit eight because an eight is one set of eight to the first. And so if we were to write eight in base eight, it would actually look to us like 10. This for example is why 10 in base 10 looks to us like 10. What we need is that the coefficients of this polynomial are going to correspond to the digits in our base x number system. Because one of the key features of a base number system is that the symbols in that base are all less than the base itself, we need to compute f of one to guarantee for sure that the base we choose is bigger than any possible individual coefficient. To get that base, we then increase that number by one, whatever it is, and we recompute the function's value at that new point. This gives us the value of the number that we are expressing in the particular base that we've chosen. Because those values must be unique within a given number base system, there will only be one possible way to express them as powers of whatever that number is. So again, in this particular case, if we get back that f of one is six, we increase that by one to seven, and we recompute the value of the function at seven, that value 462 has only one way to be expressed in base seven. 462 base 10 has to be one, two, three, zero, that is what looks to us like 1,230, but it's in base seven. So this one doesn't represent the thousands place, it represents the seven to the thirds place. The two corresponds to the seven squareds place, the three corresponds to the sevens place, what looks to us like the tens place, and then of course we have our units place, which in this case we did not need. There are lots of similarities between these objects we call polynomials and number-based systems. For example, when we learn to multiply out binomials like 4x plus 1 times x plus 2. One method we can use is called the stacking method. 
we write down the first binomial and we kind of stack the other binomial underneath it. And what we're going to do to multiply these two is gonna look a lot like our stacking algorithm for multiplication. We're gonna multiply two times one is two, two times four X is eight X. We're going to move one place over as we multiply X times one is one X and then x times 4x is 4x squared, and the result we get is the sum, just like we sum in our standard algorithm for multiplication. 4x squared plus 9x plus two. Not only do these look similar, if we literally write out 4x plus one as 41, and x plus two as 12, you can see that when we undergo our standard algorithm, two times one is two, two times four is eight, we move one space over, one times one is one, one times four is four, we get literally the same sum, 492. This works because the polynomial result here, four x squared plus nine x plus two, has entirely positive coefficients, and so essentially this is functioning like the value of a number in a base x number system. If we let that base be 10, that corresponds to what we're familiar with as 492. The beauty of a polynomial, of course, is you let those variables equal whatever you want. But so long as the coefficients are positive, this gives us a hack, essentially, and lets us fully define a polynomial from just those two inputs, f of one, and then whatever that number is, increase it by one, and compute the value of the function again there. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but I just think this is the coolest thing ever. If I say, generate some random polynomial in your mind, but use only non-negative coefficients, and then you tell me, okay, I've done it, f of one is 13, and then I say, okay, well, what's f of 14? And you tell me, 88,634. I mean, first of all, wow, you're really good at mental math, but I can take that information, 88,634, express that in base 14, and get a result, 24430 that is giving me the coefficients of my polynomial 2x to the third 4x cubed 4x squared 3x plus 0 and there it is success i think this is super fun to do it kind of gives you a way to mentally work out your different powers i have designed this little game in desmos where you can click the button have it randomly generate a polynomial for you and then if you can kind of think through well what would these different values be in a particular base system, you can figure out the coefficients of that polynomial. If you wanna play around with this, generate some polynomials, practice for yourself, you can check out the link above. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be bit.ly slash guess the polynomial, all lowercase, lowercase, uppercase, does matter for bit.ly. But just in case I screwed up that link, you will see the link down in the description, so you can check that out. Credit where due, I originally saw this on the subreddit for math, and it was just among many cool things, this really awesome thread where people talked about some of the coolest math stuff they knew. Honestly, I didn't think it was that interesting at first, but as I played around with it more and more, and as I saw a particular TikTok video from Virtual Math Lab, I will also link that TikTok video down here in the description, I realized actually, this is super cool, this is amazing. If this has also been interesting to you, I try to post math videos pretty regularly with interesting things like this, and I would love to have you subscribe. So click that subscribe button, like the video. If you wanna play the game with me in the comment section down below, you can pick your own polynomial, compute f of one, and then f of one bigger than whatever that result is, and I will try to give you back your polynomial, and you can let me know if I'm correct or not. That's all I've got for you today. I will see y'all next time.